we are looking at the New Jerusalem. Go to open your Bibles to Revelation 21. And we're looking at real preparation. And we're looking at going to be, we have been looking at the current preparation. We're going to consider that more in depth today. What is the Lord Jesus Christ doing as he is preparing a place for us? That preparation we have seen is primarily focused in on the holy city, the new Jerusalem. So once again, Revelation 21, the first verse, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there is no longer any sea. Everything that now is, is going to simply cease to exist. We looked at that last time. And then John sees, he says, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her <laughs> husband. Literally, it is a habitation fit for a bride, the bride of Christ, as well as the wife of Jehovah, or God the Father. Drop down to... Uh, Verse 10 of 21, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. The first part of verse 11. A lot of times when we try and do in-depth Bible studies, not so much here at Westside, but people do sort of get this look on their face. Whatever. <laughs> that... Uh, Unfortunately, as too many believers response, you know that there's many churches following the lead of many pastors that never teach on Bible prophecy. Uh, they say it's, you know, everybody's got too many different opinions and da 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 and let's just have our purpose-driven messages. If you know, for those of you who know who I'm talking about. Um, but welcome to Westside. This is time for minds to be under construction. So this is time to, uh, to focus in and for about the next uh, oh, 35, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. And let's see what the Lord has to tell us. I'm probably going to be a little shorter today. At least that's my target. Don't say amen. amen. <laughs> Again, just to remind us the pattern of history that we live in the church age. It's off to the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, that church age has been going on since Acts chapter 2, when the Lord founded the church, the body of Christ. He is the head, we are the body. Uh, the church age is going to end with the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is when the Lord Jesus Christ himself descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to and to forever be with the Lord. Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica. Uh, some short time, however long that may be, it may be months, it may be a, you know a year or two or three. There, there's there's some period of time, I believe, between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation period. But there's going to come a time on the earth, and we're going to discuss some of these things next week, that is going to be great chaos and danger in the world, and the Antichrist, representing the European powers, is going to come and sign a seven-year covenant with the nation of Israel, and people are going to be declaring peace and safety. Uh, we're not here for that. We're gone prior to. Um, what following the tribulation period or at the tail end of the tribulation period is called the campaign of Armageddon. With the sec That's the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Shortly after that, when that is over with, there begins a 75-day period when a lot of different things happen that we have examined. And then Christ himself reigns on the earth for a thousand years. I believe that the new Jerusalem is here uh, in the air at that time frame. That's the study that we are looking at is that city called the new Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It certainly is there in eternity, but I believe it has to be here during the tribulation period. Now, as we are looking at the 
end of the church age. We have to remember this, and this is what we'll be looking at again some more next week, is that the, we call them tribulation shadows. We did a complete study on this. But with the rapture of the church, there will be the shadows cast over into the end of the church age, times that will be similar to that of the tribulation uh, period. So we will discuss more of those things next week, but that begins to just sort of give us the orientation of what we are studying with the New Jerusalem. With the rapture of the church, uh, all believers, all believers are raptured out. We've studied that, 1 Thessalonians 13, uh, 4, 13 through 18, 5, 9 through 11. All believers are raptured out. But there are special aspects to that rapture of those who will receive the rewards. Uh, they will be glorified. There will be different levels of glorification, different levels of rewards, but they are called overcomers. We'll glance at some of that again today. The overcomers... The glorified saints will live in the new Jerusalem. Not all believers will live in the new Jerusalem. Now, this is not in the new Jerusalem will be be the New Testament believers, but also the Old Testament believers, all the believers, even the tribulation believers who are overcomers. All will be in the new Jerusalem if they are the overcomers. All believers, all believers will be in the kingdom of God will be in the millennial kingdom. That's part of the promise that comes with believing in Jesus for eternal life. Um, Jesus, go with me to John. We looked at this, but let's just glance back. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. <clears throat> Jesus speaking to the apostles, John 14, verse 1. If you're there, say amen. All right. Do not let your heart be troubled. Now, just put that into the context. Remember, remember Peter? We studied him a little bit this morning. Uh, Peter was always overconfident, tended, tended toward arrogance. Um, Jesus was just saying he's getting ready to die. And Peter says, oh, I'll lay down my life for you. Jesus said, no, you won't. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, he says in the last verse of 13, the rooster is not going to crow until you deny me three times. And that happened. But he mean, this is where a chapter break is unfortunate because the very next thing Jesus said after he said, you will deny me three times, do not let your heart be troubled. What a wonderful loving God we have. Uh, you see, just because we've messed up doesn't mean that one, we don't get to go up <laughs> and two, that we cannot be rewarded. You see, the past is the past with the Lord. When you have believed in him for eternal life, it doesn't matter what your past is. He offers you grace. Grace. You know, you got to remember, you know, um, the Apostle Paul himself was a murderer. He was a murderer. Uh, he killed and imprisoned multiple Christians. He was there when Stephen was stoned, the first Christian martyr. And yet what happened? The Lord not only saved him, but put him into service. You can go and read about it in the writing he wrote to Timothy. And then uh, he said, Paul says that I became an example to others that basically, let me paraphrase it, if God can use a guy like me, just think what he can do with someone like you. <laughs> That's the beauty of grace. You know, the sin was paid for at the cross. What we need is eternal life. Everything that from the from the moment that we place our faith alone in Christ alone for eternal life, the past has ceased to exist. You, you don't have to qualify for it. You don't have to clean up your life. You don't have to go around and beg and say, I'm sorry, I know I messed up, da -de -da -de -da. It has no, no bearing on anything. That's, a, that's what's amazing about our God. That's amazing about our Lord Jesus Christ's grace. But even then, as believers, when we mess up, you know, some of us are sensitive souls, and whenever we mess up, we must say, well, I guess I'm going to the outer darkness. I guess I'm not going to be, you know, not going to approve me because you know, I went and did this, and I did that, and da-da-da-da-da. Um, look, at, look at what, uh, right here with uh, Peter. He publicly denied the Lord Jesus Christ, and then the Lord took and played, uh, preached the first sermon in the church. You know, <laughs> If people in the modern world today will say, well, anybody can preach, but not Peter. I mean, he publicly denied the Lord. That's one reason why the Lord put him in there. 
because you say feed my sheep. God has a way of being able to straighten out crooked lives. That's why he said, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Why? Because he is God. Now look what he says. In my father's house. The father's house may refer to the larger whole thing of the kingdom, but I really believe that it's focused in the main aspect of in my fa the father's house is the new Jerusalem. Because it says, are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place, topos, a place for you. We're going to be going over to Hebrews in a moment to look at how he's prepared for the Old Testament saints and what he's doing for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, if you remember in our study of this, that this is both a place, which is number two, and an experience, verse three. Not only that, but it is written to the apostles. He's, this is not a general promise to all believers. We analyze that. You have to go back to YouTube or Rumble and see it for yourself. Uh, this is limited. This is limited to those who will be the overcomers. So he says that if I go and prepare a place for you, it is possible. That's the, what we call, again, a reminder, the third class condition, which means it is, it's not probable, but it's possible that any one of those men could fail. Fail so sufficiently in the race all the way down to the end of life, they would just quit and they would never restore themselves that he was not going to be preparing a place for them or an experience for them. But he knows that they are going to go all the way through. So it says also with us, I have gone to prepare a place for the overcomers. That also is called the father's house. It is also called the where I am place. Uh, Marty Colley uses that. I like it a lot. The where I am place. That where I am, you may be also. That's the prepared place. All of that is the, the out of the body of Christ, of the overcomers, are those that will be with him in that prepared place, the where I am place. Because the Lord Jesus Christ himself is seen as well as God the Father in the new Jerusalem. We'll be able to be in their personal presence. So remember that the kingdom of God has both a heavenly dimension and an earthly dimension. We've looked quite a bit at the earthly dimension. We've been studying now the heavenly, and that is of the new Jerusalem. We've also talked about that reward, rewards and inheritance. There are those who will be the rulers in the kingdom. The rulers are the ones that have that place of intimacy. A, listen to me, a fullness of experience goes with rulership. Some people say, well, I don't like management. I don't want to be a manager. Well, whatever is best for you is what you're going to experience. Okay, I'll show you that in just a little bit. Uh, some will be greater, some will be lesser, but they're still the rulers. They still live in the new Jerusalem. They're still glorified. Um, there will be those who will be citizens in the kingdom who are believers that they won't have qualified enough for the glorification to be able to live in the new Jerusalem, but they're not all the way down to total failures in life and what is the outer darkness that we've talked about. The outer darkness is not hell. It is that away, uh, that away from the presence of the Lord, uh, and it is a more restricted experience. Uh, but they're going to be on earth or somewhere in the kingdom for all eternity. We've also seen that the new Jerusalem is the center of the heavenly dimension. That's what we're looking at. We have seen that the New Jerusalem is a real place. We have seen it has real perfection. There is no sin within it. We have seen that there is real preparation. And we've been working on that. And we're going to wrap that up today, Lord willing. It is a real preparation of a place, a position, and an experience. For the overcomers. Current preparation. You said the overcomers will have the experience of being in God's presence. Uh, back to Revelation 21, 21.3. Uh, uh, and I heard a loud voice from the throne behold, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. That's a great voice. This is the 21st and the last time the idea of the great voice uh, has been heard in the book of Revelation. The purpose of God for his created order is now being fulfilled. Remember, what was you, why, were, why was mankind first created? We were created to have dominion over all of God's creation. In specialized aspects of however God designs us, 
to be able to have that rulership over his all of his created order. And if things go as I anticipate they have to go through eternity, God's going to keep on creating new universes, if you will, new things, and it will continue to expand. We'll look at that when we come to it. Uh, so the tabernacle of God is among men. That means it's right there with these who are in that place, which is the overcomers. Uh, that he mentions down in verse 7. But behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them. He'll manifest himself among them. He's going to tabernacle. That's the word, skeno'o, tabernacle, dwell, tabernacle with them, live with them, manifest himself with them. That's God the Father. And we know that God the Son also is there. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Only the glorified saints will be able to be in the presence of the glory of God. And he'll wipe away every tear from whose eyes? Their eyes. We'll have to analyze that. Some people think that that applies to everyone. Just drop down to verse 7. and We'll come back to those passages. He who overcomes will inherit these things. I will be his God. And he will be my son. That's an intimacy. 22, 1 through 5. He showed me the river of the water of life. Clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. What did I say? God's throne is there. The lamb is there. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God. Both are fully God. And we talked about the Trinity last time. Both are fully God. They are present in this city. In the middle of the street on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yield on its fruit every month. We'll look at all that. The trees of the uh, the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it, and his bondservants, his slaves, will serve him. That's the overcomers. That's that position of service where he is absolute Lord over everything. But if you say, I don't like the word slave, let me tell you something. There is no master so perfect and so wonderful and so gracious and so loving as this one. <laughs> so you believe me, it is, it is not a negative term. Uh, and they, they will see his face. That is that, that his faith is in the singular, but it refers to God and of the Lamb. Both the Father and the Lamb are fully God. That's why they can see his face. And his name will be on their foreheads. The idea of a special identification of closeness with no barriers. To have his name means to reflect his glory and being glorified yourself. So all of that is there. That's when... Back in John, again, he said, where I am, you will be also. This is the where I am place. This is what he has gone to prepare. That experience of being in his immediate presence. You know, 19, 7 and 8 is the bride of Christ. Look what it says, chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? The Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God has come and his bride has made herself ready. Not she was made ready as in the moment you, you became a believer in Jesus. Suddenly now you're the bride of Christ. This has to do with what follows that. You have to believe in Jesus for eternal life to be able to experience these things. But you see what you do after that matters. You're still going to be in the kingdom. You still have eternal life. You're still with God. But there's experiences and, and activities and things that you're going to want to participate in. God himself has planned them for each and every person. But we have to qualify for those. That's why it says the bride has made herself ready. Look at verse 8. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Do works matter? Absolutely. Do they matter as far as your eternal destiny is concerned? Absolutely not. Jesus said, he who believes in me has everlasting life. It's called a punctiliar belief, if you will. It's like a period at the end of a sentence. There's nothing else after that. Believe, period. Now you're going to be with him. However, that puts you into the kingdom. Now the dynamics of everything that he wants to give us opens up before us. 
So let's just think a little bit more about the New Jerusalem. All of that we've covered before. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 11. We also covered this, but let's look at a little different way of looking at it. Hebrews chapter 11. You still with me, church? All right. Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. He's talking now about the Old Testament saints. Hebrews chapter 11. Verses 13 through 16. If you remember in 9 and 10, we talked about, we read about Abraham who considered himself just an alien in the land of promise, as it was, which is the kingdom promised land. But it said he was looking for a city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. That is the resting place of God. That is the, where the presence of God is. That's the new Jerusalem. Now look at 13. All these died, speaking of others, speak all these died in faith without receiving the promises. That is the promises of the city and the heavenly country uh, because they weren't there yet. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed they were strangers and exiles on the earth. See, that's the correct attitude of believers in time. It's not about here and now, it's about there and then. That's the point we have to drive home to ourselves. For, the, for, the, for those who say such things, make it clear that they're seeking a country of their own. Remember, we have both a country, the heavenly country, the dynamic country of the millennial kingdom, um, as well as a city. For indeed, if they've been thinking of that country from which they went out, that is things here in time, they would have had opportunity to return. They don't go back to the old ways of life. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. We just read about that in Revelation 21. For he has prepared a city for them. Their work in time is complete. So the preparation here for these Old Testament saints is already completed, but it is an individualized preparation. What they did in time, while they were serving the Lord in time, he was preparing a place for these Old Testament saints, just like Jesus is preparing a place for the New Testament saints. They, will, they didn't know about all of that. They didn't get to experience here in time because of the greater promises of the new Jerusalem, the greater promises of the coming kingdom. So who are, who are the they? Well, that's the faithful believers. That they live with their mind focused on the heavenly city. Look what it says in uh, verse, verse six. For without faith, it is impossible to believe him. In this case, faith, or to please him, excuse me. Without faith, it is impossible to believe him. Faith in what? Faith in all of these things that he talks about. For he, he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him, those who diligently seek him. Seek him. That, that's what the word means. It means intent on being pleasing to him so that then they can experience the promises of God. That was their focus. That's why they lived as what? Strangers and aliens in time. That's the beauty of it. How does that apply to us? This is the completed work of these saints. How does that apply to us? Go with me to the book of Colossians. We spent a lot of time in Colossians last week. Colossians chapter three. These are verses with which you are not unfamiliar, especially verse two, since you hear it every class. <laughs> Colossians 3, verse 1. Therefore, if you have been raised up with him, and you are, chapter 2, 12 and 13, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. That baptism is not water baptism, that's spirit baptism. At the moment of faith alone in Christ alone, the spirit of God indwells you and places you into, plunges you into the church of God, the family of God, the body of Christ, uh, and raise him up through the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and uncircumcision of your flesh, that is you, before you were a believer, you just had a sin nature, you were spiritually dead, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us. How many of our transgressions? How many? 
Say it again. How many? Look at that. Look at that. You mean even if you, yeah, even if you, whatever you want to fill in behind the dots. Just like that. I believe in Jesus for eternal life. What's he do? He gives you eternal life. What's he say next? Forgiven. It doesn't exist. You can't get away from that. But you see, that's the kind of attitude that they had. You, you have been raised up with Christ, 3-1. For if you have been raised up with Christ, and you are, you're now spiritually alive. Now what happens? Keep sinking. That is, keep on doing this. Make it a pattern of lifestyle. Keep seeking the things above. Where Christ is, where the Messiah is, seated at the right hand of God. Jesus said in Revelation 3, just that you can sit down with me on my throne just as I sat down on my father, well, on his throne. He says, why? Because Jesus said, I overcame, you can overcome. The beauty of it is, is that we don't have to do this by ourselves. He's given us the word of God, the spirit of God, places in the body of Christ, the church of God. We all can be overcomers. It's as simple as that. So then that's what he says. What's the main process of that? Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. That's a volitional response. That's a choice. That's what the ones in Hebrews did. They treated the world around them as, I mean, they had to live. They had to make money. They had to support their families. They had to do everything else that you and I have to do. Only we have it very easy compared to guys that were living back then. Their average work day was, or time was six days a week from sun up to sundown, and they keep working at night many times. Most people here don't work like that. But nonetheless, they had the right mindset. They were living in the light of eternity. What is that mindset? The mindset is total acceptance of the Bible as truth. They were convinced that what God had promised them not only that God existed, Hebrews 11, verse 6, not only that he existed and that he was there, to know that he is there and that he is present and he is with them, not just that he is there and he exists, but that he was there for them. You know that because that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Total acceptance of the Bible is truth. Secondly, a consistent study of the word. Consistent study of the word. This is the word of God. This is what he wants to get into our minds. The person will never have the right mindset if they're not in this. This is simple as that. The third thing is a daily affirmation of what the Bible teaches, its morals, its values, and its relevance to life. And fourthly, a focus on receiving approval at the Bema Seat of Christ. Focus on approval. So it's just like this, the right mindset will equal the right life set in the Old Testament that's called the fear of the Lord. The right mindset will result in the right life set. That awesome respect for who God is and what his word is and living in the light of it. That's how it works. That's why Jesus said in John 14, 2 and 3, I will come again. <laughs> that's the second coming. I will come again. Do we live in the light of that promise? You know, I've had people tell me, well, it's been 2,000 years. The Lord ain't come yet. All my life, I've heard prophecy teachers saying, Lord's getting ready to come again. Lord's coming. Still ain't here. But God's promise stands. He'll come in his time, not our timing. Now, I firmly believe that the coming of the Lord is very close. We'll talk about that next Sunday. It's very close for the rapture of the church. That's what he's talking about here. Not only the second coming at the end of the tribulation, but I will come again for you. That's the rapture. I like what Marty Cauley said about that. He said, when Jesus finishes preparing the place for us, he's coming back for us. It's still being prepared. Revelation 21, two, go with me back to Revelation. Let's just look at a little grammar, 21, two. So you got to pay attention to word meanings and grammar and things because it reveals things many times you don't see in the English. But just look at this. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Now, the time, the immediate time frame of this is when? It is after the judgment seat of Christ. It's after the new creation of the heavens and the earth and so forth. 
And it look what it says, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, made ready. That's in the past tense. It's the, actually, it's the perfect tense. It means it's completed for the bride. At this time, it's fully complete for the bride of Christ. Why? Because all the bride, the, the opportunity to be the bride of Christ only happens during the church age. There it's completed completely. He is preparing for us, or his preparation for us is dependent on our preparation for him. Stay with me now. Go to Revelation 2. There's the overcomer passages. We're just going to glance at a few of them. Revelation chapter 2. And um, verse 7. I've got the wrong reference up there. That's okay. Verse 7. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That hearing ear is an ear that pays attention. You're eager to know what the Lord has to say, just like we saw today in in uh, Luke chapter 5, when the Lord was teaching. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, not unbelievers, churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Where is paradise? Paradise is the new Jerusalem. Paradise is the new Jerusalem. It's in the paradise of God. You can go back there and read it. Uh, verses uh, 26 and 27. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces as I also have received authority from my father. Chapter three, verses four and five. But you have a few people in Sardis, that is the particular city, who have not soiled their garments. They will walk worthy in me in white for they are worthy. What is the soiling of the garments? Sin in their life. A rejection of the word of God. You know, that's one reason why when we talk about rebound, you're washing your soul. <laughs> you're washing your garments is what you're doing. And they'll walk with me in white for they are worthy. Why are they worthy? Because they have kept themselves clean. He who overcomes will be clothed in white garments. I'll not erase his name from the book of life that has we're not going to get into that today, but it's not talking about you can lose your salvation, but it's about rewards. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He overcomes clothed in white garments, those same white garments we saw back in uh, 19. Look down at uh, verse, um, verse 12 of chapter 3. He who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Well, that, the pillar in the temple of God, it means a place of, of service and responsibility to God and his presence. In other words, you can't be taken out and he will not go out anymore. Rewards are eternal. And I will write on him the name of my God set apart for service to be able to serve him. That's what he says back in uh, 22, 3. His servants will serve him. Here it is again for the overcomers. Um, in the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. 21, he who overcomes, I'll grant him to sit down with me on my throne. Also, as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches, what he's saying to us. This is what it means to be an overcomer. This is what it means to be able to be in the presence of God, to live in this beautiful way. Chapter 22 and verse 12. Chapter 22 and verse 12. Behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Don't disagree with God. <laughs> verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Didn't we just see that back in three? Who wash their robes, not that you're perfect, but you know how to deal with it so that they have the right to the tree of life. Where is the tree of life? In the new Jerusalem, in the paradise of God. And what? May enter by the gates into the city. That's the reward gates. That's what God has planned. We can lose what he desires to be ours. You're in Revelation, go to 3.11 real quick. 
Bless you. You know, that'll be recorded, go around the world. It'll be here for eternity. We'll hear the sneeze. <laughs> and and your, your dangers, I think, are embedded in the wall. You can get them later. Uh, look at this in chapter 3, verse 11. Are you there? All right, focus in. I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. Faithfulness in time. What is the crown? The right of rulership, the right of being the overcomer. He says the same thing in Matthew 24, 51 and 25, 30. But I want to touch on this real quick. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians 2. Verse 9. Look at this. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen, or ear has heard, or which have not entered the heart of men, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Jesus said in John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's as simple as that. That's the overcomer. That's the one with the right mindset that results in the li right life set. And look, contend, for God has revealed them through the spirit. You know what these things say. Why? You've been looking at them. We've been studying them. Matthew 25, real quick, as we wrap up, Matthew 25. Now, according to the old time clock, it's only a few minutes after 11. Does that get, mean I get to preach another hour? Well, I didn't hear one word of encouragement. Amen. <laughs> we see amen in the fact I didn't get any encouraging words. I'm not sure. All right, Matt, let's go to Matthew, Matthew uh, 25, 21. Look at this. But his master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. Who are those? That's the overcomers. We just saw them. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master, the bliss that has been prepared for you by the Lord, his fullness of joy. These things I have written unto you that your joy might be full. That's what Jesus said. Verse 23, he says, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful in a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. The focus is on that, the words, the joy of the master. That is that whole thing that he has planned for you, that is unique to you. In Hebrews eleven sixteen, for he has prepared a city for them, that new Jerusalem, the city of delight and joy. It's 1 Corinthians 2, 9, all part of what God has prepared for those who love him. It is unique to you as your genetics are, as your fingerprint is, as your eye color is, your eye, whatever, you know, they can, they know who you are just based upon the way your eye lays out. You are unique. There is not another you, never has been another you, will never be another you. It is an individualized preparation that is a fullness of joy for you, for you. Amen. Done just your way with your skills, your talents, your spiritual gifts, ever, however God wired you and made you from birth. This will be your fullness of joy. The preparation is not primarily about building or expanding the new Jerusalem. It's the same size as it's always been. It is about the love of the Savior loving you so much that he's preparing a richness, a fullness, a joyful experience for you beyond anything you can't even think about it, Paul said in 1 Corinthians. That abundant experience of life, I'm preparing a place for you. What he's saying is this, overcomer, I'm preparing a place of maximum joy for you. Your place your position, your experience, Messiah Yeshua. Think about that. That's why it's worth anything in time of sacrifice or focus on the, what the Lord has to say. That's why he says in Revelation 19, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. 
It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. That city is made ready as a bride that is made ready for you and your experience and your joy that will resonate throughout eternity. It never ends. It only gets better. In response to the preparation of the bride, the groom, the Lord Jesus, is preparing. As I end, you see, the principle is the more we prepare by learning and living the word in obedient service, the greater will be the enhanced joyfulness prepared for each one of us. Now, let's just be honest here for a second. If we were honestly to tell each other our story, every one of us, Within that story, there's been a lot of struggles, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. Things didn't go, you know, when you were young, you had your all life all planned out, right? How many of us, that's why our life turned out. Didn't happen, did it? You know, some of you have been through some really tough stuff. Some are still going through it. Maybe physical, relational, whatever. But if we begin to do what we're supposed to in following him, first off, you have to have eternal life. But then second, really become a disciple. Then know this, that everything that you have suffered with in time is going to be made right then in such a way that you will not even be able to, at this point in time, comprehend all that fullness of joy that your loving Savior is preparing for you, personalized for you, calling you by name, preparing it for you. And you're going to realize all that stuff that happened in those few years of life ain't nothing compared to this. So he's preparing your own personalized place and experience in the coming kingdom. That's why what? Keep looking up. Jesus is coming back soon. At the very end of Revelation, John writes, even so come. Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, it is with deeply grateful hearts that we thank you that you have given us these truths, that you have revealed these things to us by your spirit in your word so that we can get some grasp in our limited minds about all that you have prepared for those that love you, of the beauty of, of the millennial kingdom and then on into eternity and the new Jerusalem and everything that is that is there, you have promised us that joyful experience of, of position and, and experience and, and place and everything. That everything that we have gone through negative in time is all going to be set right. And we'll look back and barely even remember because the joyousness of everything is so real, so powerful. What a day it will be whenever we can stand before you, Lord Jesus, and look us right in the eye, a face of love, the face of the one who gave yourself for us on the cross to pay for our sin, rose again, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and began preparing a place for those to be the bride of Christ, the overcomers, to look right into our eyes and say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. If I can paraphrase it, Jesus, I have got a bang up experience for you that you're not gonna believe it when you get there, go. Hallelujah. We praise your name. And I pray for all of us, Father, that you'll help us to become people who our minds are set on things above, not on things of this earth. That we'll have the right mindset, we'll have the right life set, living out that fear of the Lord with that right attitude, right experience in time. When we mess up, we fess up, get up and go. Thank you, Lord, for this church, for these people online, this faithful part of our church online and the FGBI leaders and men who are the teachers. I pray, Father, for all of us that when the Lord comes, 
we'll be able to stand together unified, glorified, and together enter into the experience that you have planned for us, the place you have planned for us. I pray for every person at the sound of my voice, even those on YouTube or Rumble, that they too will just take a moment and first off, make sure that they have believed in Jesus for his promise of eternal life. That's the key. That starts it. He who believes in me has everlasting life as an unbreakable promise. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the promise. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he who hears my word and believes in him, in him who sent me has everlasting life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. That's a promise. He who believes in me will never die. That's a promise. Do we believe it? If we do, then we're in your family and now we can begin the journey of victory, the journey of overcoming, the journey of discipleship. Thank you for this time. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Would you stand? And uh, open your hymnals uh, to page 654 if you need it. Change my heart, oh God, 654. Change my heart, oh Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. You are the one. I am the Hold me and this is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. Make it effort. Change my heart, oh God. May I be loved. Come and lead us in closing. Dear Lord, thank you for the time around your word. Lord, thank you for letting us worship you today, Lord. Let us know that your free gift is free, Lord. There's no strength attached. Once you believe, you believe, and you're in your house forever. Cool. Thank you for uh, the new Jerusalem coming, and thank you for uh, what you've done for us on the cross that we couldn't do ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. I commend you now to God, the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Set your mind on things above and not on the things of this earth, for you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and peace be with you. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night.